Hey everybody, it's Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking with another brand new MVP, Parag. Hello. Hi, Christian. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. For folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Yeah, so I'm Parag Desai. Uh, I'm based in London, UK, uh, and currently I'm an M365 incident responder in financial services. <clears throat> I became an MVP last week, and I have over five years uh, experience in Microsoft security. That's a, uh, it's a, it's funny. I just had a conversation earlier this week with, uh, somebody who was a cybersecurity expert and had, somebody had asked, like, asked him, uh, you know, is that even still a thing? Are companies still, do we need to have, like, uh, is there demand around cybersecurity? It's like, are you kidding? I, I'm in the governance space for information management. And the number one concern of companies is security. So if you want job security, I would say security, cybersecurity is like, it's such, still remains a hot spot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, before security, I used to be in desktop support, right? And desktop support I saw being outsourced. And I was like, what's a field that I can stay in that's going to be relevant and demanding as time goes on? And security was it. And I think, you know, with the emergence of AI and all the new technology, you constantly need to secure it. So... Is that yeah. changing? Is, is AI stuff, is it already started to impact like how you work and the tools that you use? I mean, obviously we're in the Microsoft ecosystem. I don't know if like organizations you're working with, are they using Copilot yet in that way or kind of how is it evolving and changing? Uh, so in financial services, a lot of organizations are still slightly risk averse to AI. Um, but what I can say is it will help at least, you know, with kind of low level basic tasks, like think about a SOC level one analyst, right? They're looking for, for example, reputation of hashes that they identify from alerts or from EDR. Um, or maybe there's a user that visited a website and you want to know, you know, how safe is that website? What is it known to be attributed against, et cetera? You can do all of that through AI. Uh, but I think the one main benefit that I'm really looking forward to eventually when I do use it um, is just the enrichment that it will get from your own incident data set, right? So it could say, hey, you dealt with this incident before. This is what the outcome was and this is how you got to that outcome you know, feel free to follow the same steps. And then it kind of like shortcuts your process of doing the full investigation. I think there is a lot of concern that AI is going to replace like everyone's jobs. And, you know, some concerns may be valid, but I don't think all of them will get replaced. What I would say is the companies that are looking to embrace AI and, you know, potentially as a result, replace the level one, there should be opportunity for the level one to move to level two and the level two to move to level three. So you don't get those people out of a job, but rather you empower them to move to the next level. That's all, um, that's always kind of the the you know I remember when the whole push you know towards the cloud from on prem to the cloud there was all that concern of hey our jobs are going away it's like no no it's it's you know a lot of the topics like in the MVP world a lot of the topics were about maintaining the servers that were running these products that these tools that we're using and the the because of the modernization of the technology the move to the cloud and now with AI it's the same thing. A lot of those things that we were worried about keeping the servers up and running, it's like, well, now we've handed that off. We've automated that. It, you know, the cloud vendors run that. We don't need to worry about that in the company. We can concentrate on business systems and what are the actual outputs? What are we trying to achieve using the technology? So I see that's that's happening with AI in the exact same way. Yeah, I mean, it, it can it can help that way as well. But then the question comes, like, who's liable? Like, what if AI makes a mistake? Like, for example, if a human made a mistake, you can hold them to an account if they're an employee, you know, grievance processes, dismissal, uh, disciplinaries, etc. If it's an AI, <laughs> you know, so I think the key thing there is to make sure you've got enough checks and balances, like approval workflows, for example. You know, um, from what I know with Copilot for security, every time you visit sort of a defender incident, it will generate a prompt to get a summary of that alert, uh, an incident, which could be helpful. But, you know, eventually if, and, and this is kind of a scenario that I've thought up in my head and maybe it could be proved in practice, I'm not sure, but let's say an insider threat, right? So let's say a company uh, doesn't really know what they're doing in terms of SCUs. So they've gone, you know, just like purchased like 10 SCUs or something. Uh, 
that insider threat could basically continuously visit multiple defender incidents to basically skyrocket those prompts and thus skyrocket the bill for that organization. And there doesn't seem to be a way to restrict that. One way that could restrict it if they implement it is some sort of, like I said, approval workflow. So I think, you know, even though what you said about offloading it to AI and, and things like that can help, but you need to make sure that there's some checks and balances in place where appropriate uh, to just make sure it's not kind of misused and, you know, have a hefty bill at the end of it. Well, uh, I, I realize that this is a slight, we're, we're a slightly a different t topic here too, but like, again, as a governance guy, I would say that like, well, that's, that's the beauty of automation, whether it's, you know, AI or just, you've, you've just automated your workflow and process things around there is that you get into the exception management, you start looking for the patterns of behavior and then you have the better ability. Again, you're not worried about keeping servers up and running. You're able to automate a lot of those tasks. Then you can go and look at what are the actual usage patterns? What am I seeing here? Are there bad actors that are repeatedly doing something questionable? Let's go investigate that. You're able to more readily see those patterns and then go in and put other you know, deal with that. I mean, that's part of, you know, living, breathing governance of IT systems is that you find those patterns, automate, review that, make edits, make changes, have conversations with people to understand that behavior, tweak and change. So this is a constant thing that's ongoing. You don't just set the automation and walk away and say, we're done. Because people will, once they understand how they're measured, they'll find ways to get around those measurements. So you're constantly having to tweak those things. It's like they say, attackers only need to be right once, but defenders need to be right every time. Right. right. So, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting. Well, that's, I, you, I think we just explained what we just discussed is why there's job security in the security space. <laughs> You know? yeah. Well, So how did you become an MVP? How did you find out about the program? How did you get involved? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's been sort of a dream or goal of mine, at least for a few years now. Um, how I first came across it, I can't really remember. Maybe it was probably through LinkedIn, like some people posting about it. Maybe they were sharing the trophies, you know, the different perks, etc. Um, and when I first came across it, I, I wasn't even doing content, like I wasn't really posting on LinkedIn um, as much. But I think last year is where I really started actively posting. Um, and one thing I can say, and I'm sure you know this yourself, Christian, is with MVP, the main thing that could help is if you have your own niche, like a speciality area that you're constantly you have posting to have about. That. I would say it's, it's not nice to, like you you have to have that. I mean, right. Because otherwise Microsoft looks at you, if you're just a generalist and you're talking about dozens of different things, which is, I mean, we all do that, mm. but you have to have a primary focus. And I think like, I didn't really know what that niche would be until sort of middle of last year, which was basically M365 forensics, because, uh, you know, through my work, etc., I was constantly being asked, like, what does this ID mean? What does this GUID mean? And so I took it upon myself as a challenge to try and figure it out. I reached out in the community. Not many people knew. I looked at the documentation. It wasn't there. So I was like, okay, there must be a way to do it. And then I kind of played around with PowerShell and figured out, okay, these GUIDs correspond to, you know, mailbox entities or role groups or role group members, et cetera, on the back end. And I was like, you know what, this could actually be really good content back for the community. Um, so I think getting the confidence there to just start posting and, and getting other feedback to say, you know, this is really good, keep going, uh, which then developed into talks and, and other opportunities like around book publishing. So I've been a technical reviewer. Um, by the time this comes out, I would have announced that I'm an author uh, for one book upcoming. Um, and those kind of opportunities materialized. And then it was then basically about waiting to get recognized. So people that aren't aware, MVP is a bit of a process, right? Firstly, you need to get nominated and you can either get nominated by another MVP or someone from Microsoft. So in my case, it was another MVP. So they nominated me after about like three, four months of me co posting content. So I was quite honored by that and humbled, but I also kind of thought like, I don't think I have a chance here. Like, you know, no way am I ready enough. Um, but I submit the application, but ultimately I did get rejected um, because, you know, just to get nominated is a feat in itself, but then you actually have to fill in the application with all your contributions and then get accepted. Um, but I didn't take it badly, right? And I think anyone watching that's, you know, potentially at that stage where they've kind of got to nomination but didn't make it, think of it this way, like the Oscars, right? There's six nominees, only one winner, but the nominees themselves can feel proud that they reached the final stage. Yeah. So that's the way I took it in my stride. And then I kept building. So I started trying to get more talks um, a few more book opportunities um, and contributing more to the community. 
Uh, and then this year I got renominated by another MVP um, and he was really helpful. Uh, his name's Ragu. I'm sure he doesn't mind me mentioning him. And um, he actually gave me some really good tips and advice for the application itself, um, as well as kind of telling me which potential contributions to focus on, how to structure it, how to style the language, et cetera, uh, which really helped polish up the application and ultimately led to me getting MVP. But yeah, I've had a lot of questions about it. So I'm glad you asked it because at least I can redirect people to this interview to and get so some tips. Let me ask you this too. It's like, if you had somebody come to you, because you know, as an MVP, so we all have this, you know, where we get people reaching out and saying, Hey, I like, I, I followed you for years, or I, I know you through past job or something like that. I'd be interested in this. Like, what is the process? What, what advice do you have? Like, we get those questions all the time, but let me ask you something. If somebody came to you and said, Hey, really like this, the articles that you did here, this help that you provided to the community, would you be interested in doing uh, maybe co-presenting on this topic together? Like I've never really presented before. Like, how would you respond to that? That's a really good question. Um, oh, I think I'd be open to it depending on the topic. So they would almost need to at least prove, I don't want to be kind of disrespectful when I say this, but prove your worth. Like you can't just like not know anything. Like you don't even right. know what SharePoint is or what Azure yeah. is or what Entry ID is or something, right? But if, if for example, they're showing that they have some knowledge, but they want like almost like a platform to speak at, um, and, you know, they're willing to maybe have me on as their first guest to then potentially turn it into a series or something. I'd embrace that because uh, even now I'm finding that some platforms, you know, not all platforms give me a chance. I know, uh, Christian, you mentioned you're doing a few in-person talks, et cetera. I find it really hard to get in-person talks. Like, you know, people just it don't want to that. give me a chance. Yeah. Even though I'll have a portfolio of talks that I've done virtually, they just don't take me seriously for an in-person one. And when I finally crack the first in-person one, maybe that will unlock more in-person ones. So I think to your question you know i wouldn't want to be a gatekeeper so i would entertain the option i think but equally they shouldn't be like a zero percent knowledge they should have enough right. to not necessarily equal footing but something where i can also maybe learn something ideally uh, and if not then at least they they can prove to me that they've researched it and showed you know what unique talent or spin that they've brought on the content because that's the thing right everyone shares the content in the way they want but how you take it and what key takeaways you have are unique to you so right. what's resonated about what I'm doing with you that you now feel compelled to try and collab with me, right? So these are the kind of questions I would ask. And then based on those responses, I would go for it. But I wouldn't reject them outright. If they were really basic in their understanding, I'd encourage them to, you know, maybe take a certification or two uh, to build up that knowledge and then maybe approach me again. Um, but I wouldn't kind of, you know, dismiss them entirely because that's just really disrespectful and rude. So. Yeah, I know everybody has to start somewhere, but I think that's a, that's a great point. It's like, it, it, there's a, cause there are, I've had people reach out and I'm sure you'll get this too. That is like, Hey, can you nominate me? And my first response to some of those people is like, like, I, I don't know you. These are like people just reaching out like, Hey, I'm interested in this. Could you nominate me for like, I don't know you. Like I, I, I have no, I, I don't have the ability to go and to, uh, uh, to, to recommend. I'm never going to recommend somebody if I don't feel that they're ready, that they're qualified. I know something about them. Um, that's number one. Um, but two, I mean, I, I'm always happy to connect with people. And this is, again, another LinkedIn trip, uh, a tip for everyone out there. Never just put in a, uh, like a connection without having a note. You should have a note. And then that note, I said, there's a lot of just generic, like, hey, I'm building my network. And be like, well, good for you. No, thanks. Um, unless it's just obvious in their role you know, or something that I'd be interested in connecting. Um, I look at that and say, well, then you're just a some other vendor selling services. And as soon as we connect, you're going to start pitching me and you know, looking through my contacts. Like, no. Um, so, but if you say, Hey, Hey, I saw you speak, or I read this article on this, this topic, I'm involved in that. If you put something that is personal, that there's a reason for the connection, like I will connect with you every time. Um, but if you, I always recommend like, start with getting to know, reaching out to the MVP that if you like what they're writing about, they're talking about engage with them and start that. So if, if you know the person, you know that, hey, this person asks a lot of questions. This person is clearly involved, is knowledgeable in this space based on my interactions over the last couple months. Yeah. Wouldn't you then be more likely then to say yes if they approached and said, hey, would you like to co-present? 
Like, yeah, I'm so, and I'm sorry to cut you short. I'm so yeah. glad that you said about the adding the note when connecting, uh, because I do the same. And and again, I provide that context, right? Like, hey, I saw your blog on whatever entry ID password list. And it kind of helps because then a year later, you know, maybe you'll come across them on the feed or something and be like, who is this person? So you can go to messages and then realize, oh, you've been connected with them for that long. And that's what made the connection, that post that they wrote, right? Yeah um so i i i like that as well yeah i completely that funny? with that tip it's i so i do it's funny i use um one note as an extension of my brain like i'll put in all like no, i'll go to conferences i'll read an article i'll put the link to the article and a bunch of thoughts around it when i go and i write and my primary contribution type for folks that know me is like it's, it's writing it's blogging like it's in fact at the end of this month um uh, so by the time this goes live i will have surpassed it is daily blog posts i will hit the three-year mark of every day wow. so it was a thousand ninety six posts in a thousand ninety six days or something like that but the uh, i'm not i don't suggest anybody replicate it like it's a lot of work to do that um but uh uh you know going through that process and having that much that uh, content out there um it's uh it's it's great because it's a lot of opportunities and it's different things. Going back to what we originally talked about of focusing in on one area. Like I, I write about a dozen different things. I'm interested in a broad range of, of, of topics, yet my focus is around information management systems and SharePoint at the, at the core of that. Um, so you can be creative. You can go and uh, uh, write about a broad range of topics. Um, but yeah, when I talk with people, I try to rein that back in. Like, what are we talking about? What's the focus? And I use OneNote as an extension of my brain of, I talked to this person on this day. I interviewed this person. Here's my notes around that thing. So when I'm going to write about something or if I'm searching on it, I'll even go and search in OneNote is one of the first places just to like bring that up. Like, okay, what was that? It was, uh, you know, have I written on this before? When you write that much, you tend to forget what you presented on what you talked about six months ago, three months ago, honestly, last month, I forgot what I wrote about on some, some topics. Um, and I so think to be able to capture that is important. T taking notes is definitely important, right? Cause like right now you could have an idea for an upcoming blog post, unless you write it down, you're going to forget it. So I have like a kind of like a future content ideas kind of folder. And then, yeah, similar to you, different one note pages or notepad files yep. with uh, those ideas and things. So yeah, well, no, that's really helpful. My session that I'm doing next week. So it will have already been you know, live here is actually on um, you know, leveraging AI, but about writing is about content, mm -hmm. about using it to do, uh, to create more content. So uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping to have, I know this is somebody everybody's interested in MVPs, fellow MVPs are interested in, how do I do more? How do I write more? Um, how do I create more contributions? But and then utilize that in different ways. But yeah. Anyway, going going back to I still need to put together the deck for that abstract that I submitted that I then got accepted. Now I need to go and do. But that's you know it's it's funny when you go to conferences, in person conferences, and you find in the speaker room it's filled with people who are finishing their presentations that they, again, months ago, and with big conferences, it could have been six, eight, nine months ago, submitted the abstract, got it accepted, but they're just now finalizing that. Part of that is making sure updates to the technology that it's all up to date. Um, mm. So that's- And Microsoft love to change things, right? What happens if there's a major change the day before you're presenting or something? <laughs> Not like that ever happens, but yes, <laughs> every time it happens, but, uh, well, is it really appreciate uh, your time getting, getting to meet you. Nice to meet you. And for folks that are, want to get in touch, um, where are you most active in social? Where can people find you? Uh, LinkedIn is probably my most uh, active and then uh, my GitHub as well. So my GitHub, I've kind of leveraged into my cyber portfolio. So any talks, you know, this interview will be on there as well, uh, linked at least. Um, and then any sort of certification advice or advice for new people into cyber, all of that's on my GitHub. 
Um, so LinkedIn and GitHub are the two best places to catch. Do you me. use GitHub as kind of like your blog to to uh, store all that? I, I use GitHub as a portfolio, and I've also kind of made a deciphering UAL, which is like my niche kind of content series on GitHub. So there's like markdown pages on like investigating certain operations in M365, like if you upload a file to SharePoint, um, role group additions, et cetera. So yeah, I've leveraged GitHub in a different than traditional way, because usually it's used for like coding and stuff. But yeah. I'm just using it as a repository to have a single place for all my content and stuff. And uh, so far hey. it works well. So. I just told somebody like 25 years ago, we used, uh, if you probably aren't familiar with them, but our rational clear case, which is a, you know, a, 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 uh, a, like a code management platform, IBM owns them now, but 25 years ago, we, my company that I, that I co-founded, we used it to track our documentation because it does the branching, the labeling as we have versions, as we make mm. modifications so we could see the complete history of the content. I should go take a look at how you're using GitHub and, Maybe write a blog post about that, of what I used to do, and maybe use you as an example of, of how you could go and do that. I use yeah, OneNote, sure, you use free. GitHub, but it's the same idea. It's the oh. same idea what you talked about. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I know I'm stretching this now again, but <laughs> of, of LinkedIn, right. of following the messages. You're using it as a repository to keep a history of those things and leveraging that history. How do we connect? Oh, I see. It's smart. It's a smart way to do that, folks, so. Well, thanks so much, Barat, for your time. Thanks, Christian. Thanks for having me on. Good to meet you as well. And uh, yeah, I hope your audience finds this uh, insightful. Wow. Wow.